be able to have time to go and talk to someone. And I looked out and everyone was talking to someone. So um, that was really lovely to see. Thank you for engaging and uh, stepping up to, to that. Um, it is a real, I'm really, really grateful for Neil uh, Hudson coming and being amongst us over these 24 hours. Um, when we began to plan what we wanted to do for this time and think about the theme that we wanted, um, we, f I felt that um, Neil was someone who would just serve us really, really well. Neil is in, based in Manchester. He leads the Elam Church in Salford and has done that for many, many years. Um, but he is someone who has many gifts beyond just being a, a local church pastor. He particularly has a, a strong theological background. He was, I think, vice principal, is that right, at Elim Bible College um, when it was based at Nantwich, or it's called Regents College. Um, and Neil also worked with LICC. Many of you will have connected with LICC. He was responsible for church ministries with LICC. You may well have seen him on different videos. Um, you may have read stuff that he's written. Um, and I guess my best, the thing though, whatever else he's done, um, over the last couple of years, Neil's connected into our Manchester Church Leaders Gathering as he's, he's been a bit more focused in Manchester. And um, he has just brought so much richness. What he has added into those gatherings has been really, really significant. And um, we have quite a lot of leaders who all, you know, are happy to talk quite happily. Um, but you do notice that when Neil begins to speak, everyone just leans in a little bit and goes quiet and, and wants to hear what, what Neil has got to say. We value the gift that you are not just to your own local setting, Neil, but I know your heart is to serve the wider church, and we really appreciate you coming and being amongst us. We want to open our hearts up to what God wants to say to us through you. We give Neil a really warm welcome. I hate those sort of introductions. <laughs> just lower your expectations. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't know how much you paid, but if it's rubbish, you can get your money back. <laughs> All right. It is lovely to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. I do appreciate it. And, um, and, and to be amongst you and just to, to be able to share some, some thinking with you. I wonder if you can just put those uh, slides up. This intriguing question, how to be church when we no longer fit in? And um, I guess it's a question that many of us are asking. Many of us think about sometimes really intentionally and sometimes just sort of like in the sort of the musing you do when you're sort of driving down the motorway or whatever. But um, it is actually a really significant question. How do we, what, what is our role and how do we do this thing called church? Um, and what does it mean to be disciples of Jesus in a context which is not always very conducive? As Andy said, I've, I've worked, I've been part of only really, um, I, I, I got ordained to be a pastor in 1985. Now I'm conscious that for some of you that is before you were born, which is deeply upsetting. <laughs> but, um, and, and during that time I've only really been a leader of two churches. One was in Guernsey for three years and then the rest of my time was in Salford. And I don't know if you've been to Guernsey, but Guernsey is beautiful. It's nine, nine miles by three in the middle of the channel there. And uh, when we were there, if you drove at 30 miles an hour to the town, um, the only town, um, then you didn't want to carry your keys around with you when you went to the town because they're bulky in your pocket, eh? So you pop them in the footwell of your car, close your door, uh, do your shopping, meet the whole of the island, many of whom have six fingers, and... Um, <laughs> And when you come back, your car is still there. For if they steal it, where will they go? <laughs> On an island nine, by, nine miles by three, you just walk and get it back again. It's like, you're not going to go anywhere, are you? And from there, we went to Salford. <laughs> which is very similar. Um, <laughs> In so many ways. The first week we were there, uh, on the first Friday, it was a deacon's meeting, and uh, I was very, very young, but I, uh, one of the deacon's cars was stolen, and I wanted to look like this spiritual giant. I'd been a pastor there for three days at that point, so I suggested that we would pray for the young lads, that they would turn on the cassette recorder. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about now. A cassette recorder in the car, and they would listen to Graham Kendrick singing, Make Way, Make Way. 
And only some of you now know what that is. And um, that that would lead to saving faith. Well, we had to pray that sort of prayer ever such a lot as people's cars were stolen until we started to pray a more psalm-like prayer that essentially said, oh God, get them. <laughs> I'm not sure that God ever answered any of those prayers in the way we expected, um, but that's been my home. And when I've worked at the college, when I've worked with LICC, this parachurch organization, I've only really been involved in one aspect of work, whether it's local church or elsewhere. And it's this, how do we prepare one another to make a difference for Jesus in a world that sometimes can seem very unconducive to the gospel? And essentially, I think that's what we're talking about over these next three sessions in different ways. Over the sessions, I want to do little different sort of emphases. This is a think session. All right, so there will be a moment where we're going to ask you to do that. So if you're together as a couple, can you ensure that one of you is listening? <laughs> because we will be asking questions and give you a chance to uh, reflect. This evening, we'll do some ministry as well. In London, there's uh, a, an angle on a church. This church is a church that some of you may well know. It's called St. Helen's Bishopgate. It's a good evangelical church. But it's a really interesting picture because it's overshadowed by what is colloquially known as the Gherkin, which is a hub of finance and international finance and business. And when you look at that picture, it's almost a brilliant image of what's happened in the UK over the last few hundred years. At one time, that church would have been the focal point for that whole area. But now it's overshadowed by the gherkin. And most people passing that would say, oh, that's quaint as a building. But it's not powerful, and it's not significant, and it doesn't make anything happen. But the building behind it, that's where the power lies. That's where the significance is. That's the movers and shakers of this world. So how do we make sense? Well, we do have options. And on, on the sidebar there are some of the options. There is an option to withdraw and just go, we're just going to become our holy cuddle, as it is in sale, which is <laughs> promised more than it delivered, if I'm honest. <laughs> but that idea of becoming this holy huddle and we will withdraw, have nothing to do with it. So we will only put our children in Christian schools. We will only deal with Christian businesses. We will only ensure that we have Christian friends. We will ensure that as far as possible, we only listen to Christian TV or Christian radio. Because actually what we want to do is withdraw from the culture. Because actually the culture is so unconducive. Or... We can attack and just essentially stamp our feet with indignation. This is a Christian nation. How can you possibly dot, 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 dot? Or we can accommodate. We can kind of just sort of say, well, you do your thing and I'll do our thing. You can conform and essentially become the same as your culture. Or you can accept the fact that actually we're different. I don't know if you know this guy. <laughs> a few years ago, on, on Sunday afternoon, we were having uh, lunch in our back... I mean, sale, it was a patio. It's actually a backyard. Um, <laughs> but uh, we were having lunch in our backyard, and the kids from next door were hanging over the wall, having that conversation. You know when uh, sort of six, seven-year-old kids just want to intrude. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're signing up like a, we're a Christian family. They know we're a Christian family. So you can't essentially say, can you just clear off? So we're trying to be polite and then trying to ignore them at the same time. I don't know if you have any idea of what that feels like. Um, but uh, they're chatting away and I'm trying to chat to them and all the rest of it. And then after a few minutes or a little while, well, it felt like eternity, but after a little while, 
their mother shouted, Get in here! Just shortly after, their little boy had said, Do you know what? My mum calls you. I said, No. What does she call us? She says, You're the Flanders. Get in here! Some of you might not know the cultural reference. The Flanders family were the Christian family on The Simpsons. And uh, very nice, very pleasant, uh, essentially very ineffectual often, um, but just very nice. And our neighbors thought we were the Flanders because we went to church. And um, they'd said to us on previous occasions, um, you seem to have a very good social life. People are coming all the time. I, it's just church. <laughs> But they thought we were odd. Hopefully because we didn't yell at our kids quite so much or because we were part of church. But you know, they had no idea how weird we were. That's right. They thought we were odd because we went to church. They had no idea. That each morning I'll sit with a book that last was, had a contribution 2,000 years ago and believe that a God who created this world might actually communicate with us. That's weird. That actually this world is a created world. It's not just become what it's become over time and change. But actually, it has the imprint of the creator all the way through. They have no idea that we believe we have an explanation for why we're so brilliant and so awful at the same time. That creation and fall... They have no idea that we believe that 2,000 years ago, the actions of one person who was a God-man on a cross actually changed the course of my life and the course of all humanity. That's weird. They have no idea that we believe that the Holy Spirit of God, this God who created the whole universe and blew upon us little frail dust people, actually comes and lives within us. That's what we believe. That's weird. They have no idea that we believe that the church is the hope of the world. That people get saved from sin and find purpose. And that that's how they make sense. That's weird. They have no idea that we believe that one day God will wrap all of this up. And the kingdom of heaven will become the kingdom of this earth. And God will reign. And all will be restored. Now if they knew that about us, they'd move. If you spend your time with Christians, and that's a soul sort of circle, you forget how weird you are. I wonder whether it was any easier for the first century Christians. When you saw the imperial beauty and authority of the empire, and here you were, this little group worshipping a different God. You may well know that early Christians were called atheists because they didn't believe in all the other gods. And people looked at them and went, you're the atheist, aren't you? Because you don't enter into the rest of our societal engagement. I wonder if it was any easier for them. I think not. So how do we encourage one another? How do we help one another live in this world? Well, I think that the first epistle to Peter is probably one of the New Testament books that really helps us the most. It's only five short chapters, as you know, only too well. And many of you will know it quite well because you'll have read it multiple times over the years or heard sermons on it countless times. But actually, I think as an epistle, a letter to people who are trying to stay faithful in the midst of an empire that is so vast and so different and so intimidating, I think 1 Peter really helps. I'm not going to do a massive exposition. That's not really my purpose here this afternoon. But I am going to just hold us to it for a moment or two. This is how it begins. 
Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Peter's writing a letter to people scattered, and this is just out of interest, this is where they're scattered. It's in that context of, in that country that we would call Turkey. And um, you've got there the, the reference points to these groups of people that he is talking to. And each of these sort of areas, there were very small groups of 20 or 30 believers scattered all across that area. But all of that area was, of course, part of the Roman Empire. And each of those areas were different. It's a little bit like, it was interesting when um, uh, Andy did that thing of, you know, you calling out where you were all from. It was interesting to hear the different volume, actually, um, that you gave to where you came from. But there's the people from Bury and Oswestry and Blackpool, and I, I'm just, I jotted them down, I think, Carnarfon, Sale, who, who did I miss? <laughs> and somewhere called Bangor. <laughs> You see, in the context of the UK, it's just like the Northwest. But you know Bury is not the same as Bangor. And don't you dare say Blackpool is the same as Sale. I mean, heavens above, some of you live in Eccles, and you know that Eccles isn't the same as Salford. I mean, it's like, you know, we get really, really parochial, don't we? Because we've got our own stories, we've got our own histories. We've got our own accents, and sometimes we've got our own languages. We've certainly got our own sort of climate and geography, and that's the same here. All these people that P Peter is writing to, they have their own stories, but this is the place where they're scattered to. And Peter wants to write to them to encourage them to stay faithful in the midst of an empire where they are very much the minority. Some of you will have heard of a guy called Tom Wright. Tom Wright's a brilliant theologian, um, a brilliant author. Um, he writes books quicker than most of us can read them. Um, so he's multiple books, but he's really helpful. And in one of his books, he wrote this. And he's talking about Paul, not Peter, but it kind of would uh, relate to both. And I, I feel for, certainly for people in our tradition, that sort of Pentecostal charismatic tradition, his words here are actually quite a challenge. Paul's work was not as a traveling evangelist offering people a new religious experience. He was an ambassador for a king in waiting, establishing cells of people loyal to this new king and his way of living. I'll just read that one more time with you. Paul's work was not as a traveling evangelist offering people a new religious experience. He was an ambassador for a king in waiting, establishing cells of people loyal to this new king and his way of living. Now, I think why I've chosen to, 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 to sort of introduce that quote is because I think it would be quite possible, and I think at times it is actually quite possible, for people in our tradition, I share your tradition, that actually this idea of having a religious experience becomes the reason we gather together. Uh, some of you are old enough and you've been around the block enough with church to know um, people who've left your church going, they've got better worship down the road. Uh, they're never as crass as that, but essentially that's what they're saying. And you know how hurtful it is. And you know that actually everything within you, although you're gracious, everything within you goes, that never was the deal. You know, it's that old-fashioned thing that you've heard so many times. I didn't enjoy the worship this morning. Well, that's okay, because it wasn't for you. <laughs> <laughs> you see, when we make our religious experience, did you feel it, the center? This is what can happen. To use the words of a man called Os Guinness, we become privately engaging but publicly irrelevant. Privately engaging means a lot to us. 
but it makes not a jot of difference in the rest of the world. Now, you may well want to take on Tom Wright, and if you do, well, good luck to you. <laughs> but I think his main point is this. What was the New Testament trying to do? The New Testament was wanting people to say, in this non-conducive empire where there is a Lord, you know that only too well, actually, what does it mean to be faithful to a king in waiting? What does it mean to form one another in such a way that we understand how to live this out in a context where the rest of society might actually be going in an opposite direction. As Tom Wright wouldn't say, what does it mean to be the Flanders family? Listen how Paul, uh, Peter begins his letter. You are elect and you are exiles. It's almost his first words in this letter. And in using these words... He tells the whole of the Old Testament story. You've come across these concepts before. Elect an exile. Election began in Genesis 12. The whole echoes of the Abraham story. What happens? Well, you've got chapters 1 to 11 from creation in the garden all the way through the fall, all the way through the flood and the recreation, and then the disaster of Babel. And God says, I'm going to start a new story. How does he start a new story? He takes two people who are childless and old and says, I'm going to bless all nations through you. In you, all families of the earth will be blessed. I'm calling you. I've set you apart. I've chosen you. You're elect. Now, some of us have come from contexts where we know Christians argue about what all of this means. And most of those conversations about election and all the rest of it that goes with it are absolutely sterile and ultimately damaging to one another. Because what we've often wondered is... Am I elect? And what about those who are not elect? But actually, if you see it through a biblical, I would want to argue, a biblical lens, a story narrative lens of what happens to Abraham, why might God have put his hand upon you? It's so that you would be a means of blessing to the whole earth. To be honest, that's why you're here. You weren't elect in order that you could get to heaven. You weren't elect in order that you could just sort of be plucked out of your context. You're elect in order that you can go back into your context as the people of God. And most of us would own up to go, in the light of what you're asking me to do, I feel too, use it as an analogy, I feel too old, I can't have children, I don't think I can do what you're asking me. And God says, just watch. We're too small. We're too fragile. There's too few of us. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, that the Old Testament story seems to take great delight in consistently saying throughout the whole of the Old Testament, if there's too many of you, we'll get rid of some. <laughs> it is one of the thematic motifs that run through the Old Testament. Why? It seems, just seems to be that God takes great delight in going, I love it when you feel like you're useless. <laughs> I love it when you feel like you can't do it in your own strength. I fear when you think you can. How many of us look at our church gatherings and go, do you know what, if there were more of us, we could do really, we could, we're just one bass player away from revival. It matters not a jot how many there are of you. It matters not a jot whether there's 200 of you or 20 of you. 
Because when you gather, this is what you look like. Some of you have seen these slides before or uh, similar slides. The red dots, six red dots out of 100. The six red dots, and this only relates to the UK, represent the percentage of people who go to church once a month or more in this country. 6%, thereabouts. Difficult to get exact figures, because when church leaders are asked how many people are in your church, we lie. (laughs) (laughs) What we say is, well, if everybody turned up, (laughs) that we'd ever buried. Um, It's not that the rest of uh, the 94% don't necessarily believe. Certainly it's true that uh, the rest of the, amongst the rest of the 94% people pray. There was a brilliant, in the 1980s, a brilliant sociological study done in Birmingham. They went on the estates, and it was written up in a book called Inner City God. And um, uh, Grace Davy, who was a sociologist of religion, went and asked people about their prayer life amongst people who didn't go to church. And she asked how many people pray. And of course, lots of people pray. And then the subsequent question was, do you, pray, uh, do, you be- do you believe you pray to a God who hears and answers your prayer? And one correspondent wrote back and said, no, I just pray to the ordinary God. <laughs> there's not many of us. So when we gather, there's a number of things that need to be true. Number one, we gather in order to be shaped into a different story. We do not primarily meet in order that our needs are met. We meet in order that we are shaped into a certain type of people. If we meet only that our needs are met, we are buying into a consumer culture. If we meet because this gathering of people shapes us to be a certain type of people, Why does God allow really awkward people to join your church? (laughs) Some of you are going, that's that's never happened to us. (laughs) It's so you will learn patience. And you will learn to love those who are not like you. And you will learn to understand those that you don't naturally relate to. In order that, when you're back in the office... All that you've learned here spills out. So we meet not for our needs, but we meet to be shaped. That's why you have house groups or life groups or whatever you call them. That's why your children are taken and not just given a bouncy castle every week, which they would prefer. (laughs) Because you're trying to shape them into a story. That's why we have sermons every week. Not because somehow, how else would we fill 30 minutes? But it's because actually, at least once a week, regardless of what you've done the rest of the week, you need someone to say, actually, can we do a little bit of theological thinking together about the story we live in? That's why we meet. So when we meet, number one, it's not for our needs. Number two, it's really important that when we meet, we're passionate about our faith. Now, I'm conscious that the passionate, passion and personality are related, and some people's passion is sort of like, thanks. And for other people, it's like, ah! So it's not actually about how, it's just actually we, we think this is really significant. Yeah. And I might want to say, we really need to be present. And when church becomes one thing that we do on a Sunday amongst many other things, and we'll get there if we can. Now, in a sense, I'm preaching to the choir because why on earth are you here on a beautiful Sunday, Saturday afternoon? I have no idea. I'm sure when you woke up this morning, you were praying for rain. But um, (laughs) rather than the warmest day in all April, I'm preaching to the choir here. But the point is, is the commitment that we've made to one another because we're shaping one another. It's not all about Sunday morning. Sunday morning can't do everything. But when we gather, we remind ourselves that we're elect. 
because we're also exiles. I'll come back to that in a minute. The story of the exile, of course, in the middle of the Old Testament is that a people of, the people of God, on at least two occasions, um, were essentially trying to do what people in every nation always try and do, is determine their own future. And without reference to God. And that got to such an extent that in both Israel and Judah's life, God says, if you carry on like this, I will take the land off you and you will live somewhere else where you don't belong. And the massive disruption that happened in the Old Testament was exile. The prophets had warned, if you keep on ripping one another off, if you don't think about the use of power, if you don't think about the poor, if you don't think about your social and economic policies as the people of God, you will lose the benefits and the, the joy of everything I've given you. And they were sent into exile. But the period of exile became a period where they had to relearn how do you be a people of God when now you are physically out of everything you know. No temple. No priests. No ancient landmarks where Abraham was and the rest. Where actually you're in a context where you need to learn a new language. Where you're in a context where they may actually rename you. You don't even have your family name anymore. You're in a context where everybody else is talking about a different view of the world. And now here you are holding on to the Torah. What does it mean to be an exile? And of course, prophets came and said, listen, folks, don't worry. Next year, Jerusalem. And then unpopular prophets came like Jeremiah. And they came, to be honest, we're going to be here for 70 years. So unless you were 10 when you came, you're probably not going to get home. That sort of message is never welcome at any convention or 24-hour weekend away. And what tends to happen to preachers like that is they end up being put in a pit, which is exactly what happened to Jeremiah. Now, of course, Jeremiah, remarkably, is the prophet who, in the midst of it, says, the bit that's on your fridge or somewhere, I know the plans I have for you. It's a bit that's underlined in your Bibles. <laughs> I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a future, plans not to harm you, but to bless you. But he said it to exiles. And there were some people in exile saying, how can we sing the songs of the Lord? And we just hung our harps on the willows because ain't, we ain't singing our choruses here. But actually what they did in exile was they learned how to live and that's what we've got to do. You see, that's where the church has been this week. You remember that picture of the 6% all together in the corner? That's where, the church, that's where you've been. You've not been hanging around a church building all week, I hope. I mean, I hope you have, but the rest of you, I hope, haven't. <laughs> you've been scattered. And if, I, I, you know, I, I've not really got time to, to do this in any great depth or, or, or length. Except to say this, do you remember when you saw the six in the corner? It felt like you were overwhelmed. And it felt like you could only do so much stuff. But actually, you see yourself scattered and you're in touch with so many people. You know, some of you, I know that some of you come from smaller churches. And you might go, oh, I really wish we had uh, children's work. A really thriving children's work. I really wish we did that. And some of you have got grandchildren. And your children may or may not be... Christians, and you don't have any authority, but you have masses of influence in your grandchildren's lives. And your church may not be able to do a gathered church children's work very well, but you have a children's ministry. Some of you as a church might want to say, do you know what, I really wish we could do more for the poor in our town or our city. And in your church gatherings, you've got people who are social workers and teachers and people who volunteer at the food bank. And you're doing so much. It's just you can't all do it together. But actually, once you recognize that's where we are, God has scattered his people in all of the right places. 
I don't know if you saw the clip of Tim Farron in uh, Parliament. It's not been a great week for Parliament, has it? But uh, a, a, a clip of Tim Farron speaking at the beginning of the week in Parliament, in the, in the Commons. And he was talking about Jesus um, as part of his little speech and about forgiveness and about how Jesus... Um, and he said, you know, as a follower of Jesus, I, I'm trying to forgive people who might be my natural enemy. He goes on to make his point that he was making at the time. God's got his people in the right place. Now, for this to be of any significance, two things need to be true. One is, when you scatter, you need not to gray out. If you gray out, if you become the same as everybody else, then this won't work. And secondly, you need to own your place. It's, it's, I, I can't remember your name. Luke. It was inspiring to listen to Luke and Margaret going to Yemen. And it's kind of like, I was sitting there listening to you going, wow. Wow. Going to such a tough place. But isn't it inspiring to know, there's a young couple who go, we know where God wants us. And we're going to give two years to prepare for what God's got for us. Now, they're very young. They've got two years. But <laughs> that's why you're sent to Berry. Um, but isn't it inspiring when you listen to someone going, I know where we ought to be. In my church, I want everybody I worship with to know that where God has placed them is where he wants them to be. I want them to grasp that as their primary vocation. Next week, we're doing a, a Vision Sunday in church. And, you know, from time to time, we all do it. But the vision of our church is not really about our building, because we don't own one. It's not really about what we do together. That's just sort of tactics. Our vision of our church is that everybody who worships with us has a keen sense of why they're on planet Earth and what, they're in, what God wants them to do at this point of their life. And that when they belong to our church, that somehow we will support and equip them for those places. Most of us often would think, if only I could be in a different place, I think I could be much better. Too many Christians have said to me, explicitly explicitly have said to us I'm just waiting for retirement because then I can really serve God <laughs> and it's kind of like, what was that 40 years about then how do we equip one another I'm conscious of time When you look at that first chapter, let me just go, of 1 Peter, look what Peter does. In verses 3 to 5, he encourages them to see the future certainty that they're living with. He's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. We are people who live between the times. And everything that's significant is held for us. Don't worry about that. God's got it. Meanwhile, he's placed you where you are, to serve him, to make a difference. Verse 6 and 7, it's not going to be easy all the time. In all of this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith may be proved genuine, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It's kind of like, yeah, it's not always easy. But actually, it's not without purpose. And then he goes on, verse 13 through to 16, about a determined holiness. There is a, something about, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. 
as obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he call, who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it's written, be holy because, I'm, because I am holy. We've not got time, but that idea of what, what is holiness? Holiness is not just saying no to a whole stack of stuff. It's saying yes to a lot of things. Holiness is being set apart, literally, for the purpose of God. That's what holy stuff was in the Old Testament. Stuff that God would use. So, get your mind sorted. Set yourselves to apart for holiness. The best prayer you pray is, Lord, I'm here. And I'm yours. I'm not that great. I feel I've not got everything that I would need to make a difference. I am the equivalent of Abraham and Sarah. I'm old, I'm childless, and you're asking me to do something I just can't do in my own strength, self-evidently. But I am here and I am yours. And God takes stuff and does remarkable things. And then he puts us in new social groupings called the church. We'll talk much more about that on another day, another session. So here's the, where I want to land. What does it mean to be church? Let me get the wording exactly right. How to be church when we no longer fit in. What we are is a community of disciples. People who are learning to live the way of Jesus in our context at this moment. That means that for those of you, you know, the, the time you got your first job, your first paid employment job, you recognize the world had changed. And actually, what does it mean to learn the way of Jesus in that context. The first time you were given responsibility for people at work. What does it mean to learn the way of Jesus? What does it mean to be a leader who is led by Jesus when you're leading a team at work? The first time you lost your job because you were made redundant. What does it mean to be a person who's learning the way of Jesus when you are being told, we no longer need you? The first time... You had to face some significant health issue. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus who's just been told you've got breast cancer? What's the way of Jesus in that sort of context? The first time you had a child. The first time your grandchild came along. When you retired... And you no longer could introduce yourself by your job title. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus learning the way? And the truth is this. It's never done by a course. We do not have a curriculum for this. What we have is a determined, it's what Emma was saying. How does this happen? You face into Jesus. With a determination that actually I want to learn your way. I want to be obedient in my context. And the obedience of Jesus will always lead to you reaching out to those around you. Always. Because that's his heart. I wonder what you're learning about the way of Jesus. Well, I'm done. Which is the appropriate way to finish a session, isn't it? <laughs> um, you are able to... I don't know how this bit, next bit's going to work, really. But you're going to get a cup of something. Um, a tea, coffee, whatever. And then we're going to ask you to just have a think about this sort of stuff together. Here's some questions. What did you hear that you felt was most important for you, either your church or for you? What, did you, what was most important? 
What are your scattered contexts? If we take one another's scattered context seriously, what would that mean for our church? What would we do differently? And if you were to ask the question, what are you learning about the way of Jesus at the moment, as individuals or as a church together perhaps, what would you say? Now, that last question, let me just really hit home what that question is asking. Some people, when you're, what are you learning about the way of Jesus, will say, well, Jesus is really faithful or he, he really loves me. That's not the question. I mean, it's a good response, but it's not the question. The question is, what am I learning about the way of Jesus? What is Jesus asking of me in my context at this moment? Not what am I learning about Jesus, but what am I learning about his way in my context? Now, some of you hate this next sort of idea of having to sit and talk with people. I have no idea why you're here, but some of you hate that sort of thing. And so this is my big life hack, all right? If you hate, it, this works in any church context. If when they say, can you turn around and talk to people around you, if you hate doing that sort of thing, find an extrovert who loves it and simply say to them, you go first. I guarantee you will not have to say a word. How are we going to do it? Brilliant. Lots of great stuff, wasn't there, for us to just process and think about. Thank you ever so much, Neil. Um, uh, what we're going to do is we've got um, tea and coffee that is available. If you turn around, you'll see it's all there waiting for you. Um, and so suggestion is, and Nick is doing a little dance by it as well, the suggestion is that we, um, you've got 10 minutes to go and grab a cup of tea, cup of coffee, use facilities if you want to use facilities. See, there are lots of tables set out. And the, the aim of that is that we can take our drink and go and sit round a table. Now, ideally, we won't have a berry table and a Blackpool table and a banger table. Um, we'll at least have some mixing. So please do make sure you're not just a table all of the same church. Um, and ideally, get a whole, whole mix so that we're, we're able to connect and, um, and learn from one another. And, um, and then we'll, we've got about 25 minutes to be able to talk this through, hear from one another. So, you know, we're suggesting probably about eight people around a table, six to eight people around a table, hear from one another. And then once you've listened to one another, just a bit of opportunity to be able to pray with and for one another as well and, and the sort of church context that we're from. Um, those groups, um, as they finish at 20 past four, so that parents definitely can go and collect kids. Our kids workers are, are had a long session, so uh, if we could do that face.